So hey there, good afternoon. I think people are, hi, <laughs> hello. I think uh, people are still trickling in, but I'm just gonna go ahead and get started because um, I, uh, I wanna make really good use of, uh, of this session. Thank you all for coming. I'm amazed by the turnout because I know there are a bunch of other really cool things going on. So thank you for coming. My name's Marsha Hoffman. I'm a senior staff attorney at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, how many of you know uh, what EFF is? Okay, all right. So for those who don't know, uh, we are a nonprofit based in San Francisco and we work to protect uh, digital civil liberties. And um, the talk that I'm giving here today is one that I'm really excited about because um, it's a topic I, I, I've been thinking about a lot for the past couple of years and I love to geek out about it. And in the past uh, couple of years when I've come to DEF CON, um, people really seem interested in this topic. And I speak at a lot of inf information security conferences and hacker cons and sometimes I talk about this a little bit as part of my presentations but I've never done one that just focuses on this and I'm, I'm really excited to get to, you know, completely geek out on it with all of you guys so thanks for coming. So I'm going to talk about um, the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination and uh, the way that that applies to uh, government attempts to um, force people to turn over passwords or encryption passphrases or actually decrypt information. So I'm going to hit, um, I'm going to hit three main things today. The first is I'm going to give just a general overview of the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination, you know, where it comes from, what the test is, how that works, so that we are all on the same uh, page before we start talking about the stuff that we're um, a little bit more interested in, in maybe, which is how it applies to government attempts to force people to um, decrypt information or turn over passphrases. And um, finally I'm going to talk about ways that a person could increase the likelihood of having a valid Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination um, if it ever came down to um, facing an attempt uh, by the government to force you to decrypt data. Um, so of course the standard legal disclaimer, this is not legal advice, this is just information. Um, if you have uh, a question that's particular to your own circumstance, you should talk to a lawyer about that. Um, if you don't have a lawyer that you like to talk to at this point or that you feel comfortable talking to, you should feel free to call us. And um, if we can help you, we will. And if we can't, we will make every effort to refer you. Okay, so first of all we're going to start with the basics. The, the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution says a whole bunch of things, but one of them is no person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. So in the United States, um, the, only, the only person who can force you to reveal information to the government is a judge. And a judge can only do that if you don't have a valid constitutional right against self-incrimination, all right? So here's the basic rule. The government can't compel a witness to make a self-incriminating testimonial communication. Okay, that's pretty basic, right? Pretty straightforward. We're going to come back to it in a minute and really break it down. But first let's talk about the policy behind that. Why do we have this privilege? What do you all think? Why do we, why do we have it? Forced confessions, that's exactly right. This comes from, um, it has its roots in the English common law. And um, for, you know, many hundreds of years now, I, I think it's been uh, pretty standard that, you know, society does not want a situation where people are put in this position where they have to uh, be forced to give information against themselves uh, or, um, you know, risk uh, punishment by the government. Um, the Supreme Court has called this the, the cruel trilemma. This is what we're trying to avoid, is putting a person in a situation where they have to choose between incriminating themselves, uh, lying to the government about the circumstances, or um, risk being held in contempt of court, which means that uh, you may have to spend time in jail. So, you know, we basically decided that it's, uh, it's unfair and untenable to ever put a person in that kind of a circumstance where basically the only choice they have is to give information to the government that would, that would tend to incriminate them or they could lie or they could go to jail. So we try to avoid those circumstances. That's the, the purpose of the privilege. Okay, so let's go back to the rule. Here's the rule I gave you before. Now let's break it down. Um, this rule has three basic parts. Uh, the first is uh, compulsion. 
the second is self-incrimination, and the third is testimonial communication. Okay, so first let's talk about what it, what it is to compel a witness to do something. So this is actually I think the most straightforward of the elements. Um, compulsion means a government attempt to force someone to communicate something. And um, that can be uh, pretty informal, like as in like a, a you know, police questioning. You have uh, a right to remain silent there. Um, but it, you know, it can also be something more formal, like a, a, a court officially ordering you to do something. That would also be compulsion because you're required to comply with that. Um, what we're going to find in the encryption cases is that what we're often dealing with is a, a grand jury subpoena. So let me say a, a few words about what a grand jury is. Um, I think we often think of juries as uh, you know, this, this group of people who um, are chosen from the public who decide innocent or, 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 or guilt, right? A grand jury is a little bit different. It is again actually uh, a group of people just chosen from the public, but uh, the function of a grand jury is not to determine innocence or guilt, but rather to determine whether there is enough evidence uh, that someone should be indicted for a felony. Okay? So a prosecutor um, basically kind of runs the show and um, you know, gives evidence to the grand jury and the grand jury decides at the end of the day whether or not there's enough evidence that we should indict somebody for having committed a crime. Uh, and the grand jury is empowered to um, uh, issue subpoenas to um, bring evidence in for them to see. So they might issue a subpoena to have somebody come in and testify or they might issue a subpoena to have somebody turn over uh, items or records. Um, so those things uh, are all fair game. And as we will see, that's, you know, that's, that's the deal. That has been the deal for the most part when we're talking about the encryption cases. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so compulsion, that's pretty simple. We got it. Okay, what is self-incrimination? So Merriam-Webster defines self-incrimination as incrimination of oneself. Okay, very helpful. Thank you, Merriam-Webster. Uh, specifically, the giving of testimony which will likely subject one to criminal prosecution. Now, this is really important. You know, I think a lot of people think that you, that, that, that a person would tend to invoke the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination or the right to remain silent because they don't want to admit guilt right? And so basically if you're invoking that right it must mean you're guilty. Well, um, self-incrimination does not mean that you're saying you're guilty. What it, what it means is um, that you are giving something up that might subject you to criminal prosecution. And think about it. I mean, sometimes people are indicted for crimes and they're ultimately found guilty. But sometimes people are indicted for crimes and they're ultimately uh, found innocent. And so that's a very important thing to remember. You have this right if you're innocent uh, and you also have it if you're, if you're not innocent. Basically what, what we're saying here is that you have a right not to give information to the government that might result in you being subjected to criminal charges, okay? Uh, a, few, a few items about this. The privilege can protect any link in the chain of evidence needed to prosecute. Um, so it's not even just smoking gun evidence. I mean, it, it, it could protect something that would ultimately lead to discovery of other evidence that might be incriminating. So it's kind of broad in that sense. Uh, it can only be invoked by the person who would be incriminated. So uh, if you have information uh, that's incriminating for a friend, you can't invoke the privilege against self-incrimination to avoid giving up information about your friend, okay? Uh, similarly, corporations don't have a right to um, invoke the privilege. I mean, this is something that is very specific to an individual and, you know, that individual's own situation. Um, yep, I already got that. And as I mentioned before, I really want to emphasize this innocence part. And um, if you want to read more about this, I would encourage you to, to look up this article online by a lawyer called a, a lawyer named Oscar Michelin, which is a, a really simple, easy read. And he talks about the history of the, the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination and the fact that it protects um, innocent people. One of, the, one of the examples he uses that I thought was really interesting was this hypothetical. Like, imagine you're at a party and um, somebody is assaulted at that party and you didn't do it but uh, a friend of yours did. And the police uh, come knocking and they say, hey, you know, we'd like to ask you a few questions about the situation last night. Um, 
So w what Oscar Michelin says about that is that he would advise a client in a situation like that to, uh, to invoke the right to not answer. Because um, basically if you talk to the police and you say, yeah, I was at that party last night, and you say, yeah, I know there was an assault, you've basically already admitted uh, a lot of the information that might be needed for them to charge you as a suspect, even if you didn't do it. Um, and you know, all they need at that point is for somebody to say, correctly or wrongly, that you know, they think maybe you did it. And you know, at that point, you, you may be falsely charged. And you know, he says, why would you, if you don't have to help them at all, why would you? Why would you give them anything that they could use against you? Because they can't use your silence against you, right? So I thought that that was a really interesting and good example. And um, you know, I, 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 this innocence thing, I know I keep harping on this, but I, you know, it's because I think a lot of people have a misconception of this privilege. And you know, the, the Supreme Court in a case called uh, Ohio versus uh, Reiner in 2001 you know, made this really clear. Um, in that case, the Ohio Supreme Court decided that a, a person who maintains innocence cannot also invoke the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination and the Ohio Supreme, sorry, and the U.S. Supreme Court reversed that and said, no, nope, that's not true at all. Because, you know, what we really want to do with this privilege is protect people who uh, may be caught in, you know, ensnared in ambiguous circumstances. Um, and, you know, actually haven't done anything wrong but, you know, it might look like they, they might have. Okay, so that's incrimination. Now, the third one is, uh, the third element is testimonial communication. You, you know, you, the government can't compel a witness to make a self-incriminating uh, testimonial communication. This is the really sticky wicket. And this is the, the issue that's been, I think, most at issue in the encryption cases. So a testimonial communication is one that reveals the contents of your mind. It's something that reveals your knowledge. Um, a testimonial communication is not something that already exists, okay? So if you happen to have an item in your possession and, uh, you know, the, the police try to compel you to turn that over, you know, if it's just some item, um, that's not a testimonial communication, right? Basically they have to be forcing you to say something you know. And the Supreme Court has uh, made a comparison that I think is useful when we think about this. Um, the Supreme Court said, you know, imagine the police uh, trying to force you to reveal um, the uh, combination to a, to, a, to a combination lock uh, versus you know, them asking you to surrender a key in your possession. Um, obviously the, the combination would be in your, in your mind. Uh, the key is not in your mind and so the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination would protect the first but not the second, okay? And, you know, for similar reason, the, the privilege doesn't um, protect you from having to turn over things like handwriting samples, voice recordings, blood samples, fingerprints. These are things, they are just facts about you. Everybody has these, these things. Um, if they try to force you to turn this kind of thing over, it generally would not, in, uh, it would not uh, implicate the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. But there's a twist that gets a little bit uh, tricky. So the Supreme Court has said that the privilege against self-incrimination can apply to an act of production if it has testimonial aspects to it. So there can be circumstances where law enforcement or the government asks you to turn something over and the fact that you turn it over can reveal something testimonial. So what would that be? The circumstances we're talking about are situations where producing something would tend to confirm the existence of it or its authenticity or that you had possession of it or control over it. And if that is um, something that would tend to incriminate you, then the act of turning it over might be protected uh, by the Fifth Amendment. So I just told you though that, you know, turning over a key wouldn't, wouldn't implicate that, right? So how do we, how do we parse these things? Um, the courts have talked about it in a way that I personally find instructive. Um, they talk about a gap in knowledge. I mean basically what we're trying to protect uh, is something that you know uh, that the police don't know 
and they're trying to force you to tell them what that thing is, right? So um, there was a case called United States versus Ponds uh, in the DC circuit that, that had an example that I thought was, was useful. Um, imagine two scenarios. One scenario is uh, the police uh, suspect that you might have uh, shot somebody and murdered him. Um, and imagine uh, they go to a grand jury and ask the grand jury to force you uh, to turn over the gun that you shot that guy with, all right? So turning that over would show that you know that you shot this guy with this particular gun and you had control over it and here it is. That I think pretty clearly would be uh, incriminating. Now imagine a situation where they think that you shot this guy with this gun and they go out and they do a little uh, investigation and they learn that um, you have a gun that you purchased and that it has a certain serial number and then they come to you and say uh, please turn over the gun with the serial number. Now if you turn over this gun uh, you're admitting that you have control over it but they kind of already knew that because you bought it and they have evidence of that. Um, and what you're admitting is that you have control over this gun with this serial number. It's not that you have control over the gun that you shot the guy with, right? And so you're admitting a lot less that they don't already know. So I think in the first example there's a pretty big gap in knowledge between what you know and what the police know. And in the second example it's a much smaller gap. And I think that in a situation like that the, the privilege against self-incrimination would be less likely to apply. All right? Does this all make sense so far? I know it's a little bit tricky. It's, uh, it's, it's, there's a, like an area in there that's a little swampy and, and I sympathize. I feel that way too. So there are some limitations to the privilege. Uh, first of all, if law enforcement is able to get the same evidence in a different way other than forcing you to tell them, uh, they can use it against you. Um, second, they can offer you immunity. And in certain circumstances this can overcome the privilege. What they can say is um, if, you, if you give us this, this uh, information we will not uh, use it against you and um, th in, in that kind of a circumstance basically it's not incriminating anymore so your privilege basically evaporates, right? The important thing about that is that the immunity has to be as broad as the privilege. There can't be some gap there. And um, that, particular, um, that particular thing is something that's come into play in the encryption cases. We'll talk about that a bit. Um, and, you know, again, as, if you cannot be incriminated, you have no privilege against self incrimination. So, um, so that's the deal with immunity. Here's the other big thing foregone conclusion. If uh, the police already have a pretty good idea that evidence exists, and uh, that you have it and where to find it, then the privilege may not apply. And again, this goes back to the gap in knowledge, right? I mean, if, if they already know that you've got something and, um, you know, it's just a matter of turning it over, there's not a lot that you know that they don't. And at that point, it's just kind of a matter of surrendering evidence as opposed to, you know, them compelling you to tell them something testimonial. Um, a cu I, I think three circuit courts now, uh, DC, uh, Ninth Circuit and Eleventh Circuit have said um, the government has to know about the existence and, and location of the evidence with reasonable particularity. I don't know what that is. Reasonable particularity. I think it's whatever the judge thinks it is. So here's something to keep in mind. Um, people ask me sometimes, you know, well wait a second, you know, if, if, the, if the government um, has, you know, proper legal process and they've, you know, kind of checked all the boxes and the, the, the uh, guarantee against um, unreasonable search and seizure hasn't been violated, then aren't they just entitled to this stuff? I mean, like, how does, how does that work? So something to keep in mind is that there's the Fourth Amendment, which protects against unreasonable search and seizure, and there's the Fifth Amendment, which protects against um, uh, self-incrimination, and they are distinct and separate things. And it is possible for the government to do everything right over here, check all the boxes and no Fourth Amendment violation is happening, but if they are forcing you to, uh, to make a testimonial communication, that is something separate and distinct. And um, I think we'll see how that plays out a bit as we talk about the cases. So the cases. I'm going to tell you about all the cases that have ever been done in this area. 
and there aren't that many, there are like five, so don't worry, it's not going to take all afternoon. But um, I think it's really interesting to go through and see exactly how this has uh, come to pass uh, and, and we are where we are now. So the first one is a case called in re grand jury subpoena to Sebastian Boucher. And this is a case that came up uh, several years ago. Uh, you'll see there are two uh, citations there. There are two opinions in this case, the first in 2007, second in 2009. What happened here is there is a guy, Sebastian Boucher, wonderful name. He was coming from uh, Canada into Vermont, crossing the, the border. Um, I'm not going to get a whole lot into Fourth Amendment stuff here, but uh, I will tell you that your Fourth Amendment rights at the border are not very strong. In fact, they're quite weak. And so uh, border agents can search pretty much anything uh, that you bring across the border. And he uh, drove across the border and uh, in his car he had with him a laptop. And um, as far as I can understand from the op opinions, I think the laptop was probably on. And um, he was stopped and uh, the border agents uh, searched his stuff, including his laptop. And uh, there was a border agent who spotted something on there that made him concerned that there could be child porn on this laptop. And so he calls in uh, another, uh, another border agent who's, um, uh, you know, kind of more, more forensically uh, skilled. And um, this guy questions Mr. Boucher a little more seriously and looks around the laptop a bit more. And, you know, he, uh, he actually asks, he says, hey, do you have any child porn on this laptop? And Mr. Boucher says, well, you know, sometimes I download things from the internet and, um, you know, I, uh, I, I don't think it's child porn, but if I ever see that it is, then I just immediately delete it. And uh, the border agent says, oh, okay, and where on this laptop do you keep those files that you download from the internet? And the guy says, oh, well, it's uh, here in this drive. And so he directs him to the drive and the border agent looks around and uh, spots things that he's pretty sure are child porn. So at that point they um, arrest Mr. Boucher and um, he is uh, facing the possibility of, of charges for child porn. Uh, they shut down the laptop and uh, later they realize that uh, the drive that he had directed them to is encrypted. And they say, uh, well, that's a problem. And I, I think they try, to, they try to brute force it, no luck. And so they go to the grand jury and they say, uh, we'd like you to uh, force Mr. Boucher to um, give us the password to this drive. And a, a magistrate judge uh, listened to that request. Now a magistrate judge is, uh, you know, kind of the, you know, all judges are highly esteemed and, and res greatly respected people, but a magistrate judge is kind of the lowest level judge that there is. Um, again, they're all highly esteemed people and... <laughs> Now the magistrate judge wrote what I, I think is a really great opinion. The magistrate judge said, well listen, I think that if you force him to turn over this encryption passphrase, uh, that is going to violate uh, his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination because it is a, uh, it's compelled, obviously. Um, it would be incriminating, obviously. I mean, they're looking at charging the guy with child porn. Um, so the question is, is it, is, it t is it a testimonial communication? And you know, it's something that exists in his head if he, if you're making him give it up, uh, it, it's pretty clear to, to us that that would be, um, that would implicate the, the Fifth Amendment. Um, the government said, well, uh, we would be willing to give him immunity uh, for the act of production. Um, so think about that, the act of production. So basically they couldn't use the fact that he turned over the password against him, but that would still make it so that they could use anything they learned as a result against him, okay? Well, yeah. I, thank you. Thank you for that look. I know, right? I, I thought that too. Well, th this, this puts people in, a, in an interesting situation because, um, you know, as I mentioned before, in order for immunity to, you know, kind of wipe out the, the privilege, it has to be coextensive with the privilege. And if we go with this act of production theory, then what that means is that, okay, it can't be used against you that you type in a password or something, but then it's like, oh, look, look at all this evidence. I don't know where this came from. It's like the elves just delivered it onto my desk. <laughs> 
and the Supreme Court has actually said this. They didn't use the elves thing. That's me. But they, they called it the, the, the manna from heaven theory. It's like it, the evidence just magically appears. It's like, oh, look at this evidence. I don't know how this got here. Um, and then they can use it against you, right? And the Supreme Court in a case called United States versus Hubble said, no, 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 no you can't do that. I mean, if, if it's going to be extensive, you know, if, if, the, if the immunity is going to be uh, coextensive with your privilege against self-incrimination, then it has to extend not only to an act of production, but whatever they learn as a result of that, all right? But of course, you know, if the, if the government can find that out in some other way, then, you know, that's fair game. So, so here, um, the magistrate judge, our, our good friend, the, the highly esteemed magistrate judge, um, said, you know, this act of production thing, I don't think that's going to cut it. I think that you would have to, you would have to have a, a, a broader immunity than that. And he also said, you know, I also don't think it's a foregone conclusion that you are going to find uh, you know, what you're looking for on there. I mean, you might find that, but there are all kinds of other files too that you don't know anything about and you don't know what they are. And, uh, you know, I, I think that foregone conclusion certainly doesn't extend to that stuff. So um, I'm going to deny the government's request here. I'm going to quash the subpoena. I love that legal term, quash, quash the subpoena. Um, so the government was like, okay, well, what if we do something else here? What if instead of having him turn over the password, what we do is um, he, we just compel him to turn over a decrypted version of the data, all right? And, um, th you know, this is kind of like a, like a funny, like, procedural thing. Um, it's kind of framed as an appeal of the lower order, although they kind of, you know, change the request over the course of time. So, um, you know, at this point we're dealing with a full-fledged district court judge um, who's hearing the appeal, but he's actually looking at a slightly different issue. It's no longer about, you know, whether this guy's going to turn over the password. It's, it's about whether he's going to decrypt the information and then turn over a version, an unencrypted version of that information. So it's different. And this judge says, okay, well, um, I don't think that the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination goes to the underlying data because that was voluntarily prepared. It's already there. That data itself is not testimonial. However, the act of producing it uh, is something different. Um, he didn't go so far as to say that there was a valid Fifth Amendment right uh, to, you know, not to produce this information. But what he said was, here I really do think that it was a foregone conclusion that they are, that they are going to find the evidence that they're seeking there because they, the guy showed them where it was. Like they know exactly where it is. It is in the Z drive. You know, he saw the file names. Like he knows. So, you know, back to our gap in knowledge. The, the, the gap in knowledge between what Mr. Boucher knows and what the government knows is basically nil. And so um, I'm going to order that uh, Mr. Boucher produce uh, what the government's asking for. Interestingly, he also ordered that uh, they could not use the act of production or anything they learned as a result against him. So while they ultimately found that uh, he did not have a valid privilege against self-incrimination that was strong enough to keep him from having to turn it over, um, he still ordered that, um, you know, the, the government had to comply with a certain immunity that they hadn't even offered, like it was broader than they had offered. So I think that's a very strange uh, twist in that case. And um, I, I, you know, I speculate that maybe the judge, you know, had some concerns. Um, about the about the privilege, even though he found that ultimately it was a foregone conclusion that the government was going to find what it wanted there. So that's Boucher. So this case, I actually learned about not so long ago. Um, this case was decided between uh, uh, Boucher number one and Boucher number two, the two decisions there. And um, it is unclear to me that the court even knew about Boucher at all when it made this decision. This is United States versus. Uh, I can't even begin to, this is, this, you, you see it. <laughs> Gavagno, I'm going to get, I don't know. Um, so in this case, uh, things are a little bit difficult to, to understand because there's not a great deal of factual um, uh, development in the opinion. And so as far as I can tell, what happened here was there was a guy, he worked for a government agency. Uh, they issued him a government computer to do his work, and then they found child porn on it. And, um, 
you know, he had, you know, signed an agreement saying that, you know, his computer usage was going to be monitored and X, Y, and Z. And so, um, so yeah, so, so we're dealing with, uh, with another child porn case, which by the way you'll see is uh, a bit of a pattern. Um, so here th there wasn't a grand jury subpoena involved, but what happened is after invoking his right to speak to an attorney, uh, the police asked him for the password to his computer. And he gave it to them. And then later he challenged, um, he challenged that and said that it, it violated his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. In a very, very short little bit of analysis, it's literally like a paragraph, um, the court decided that it was a foregone conclusion that the government was going to find that stuff because the government independently knew that this guy was like the sole user of this computer. And, um, you know, the court didn't go much further in its analysis than that. Um, but, um, you know, this is one of these cases where, you know, I, I think we see something important about the law, which is that often, um, when circumstances look really bad, like when we're dealing with a possible child porn case, um, I think judges often, they want to make sure that a, a bad person gets what's coming to them, right? And sometimes they don't think about these legal issues terribly hard or anything. They just, you know, it's kind of a barrier that's getting in the way of making sure that justice is um, done. And um, so bad, you know, what we say in law is bad facts make for bad law. Um, this case I don't think is, you know, terribly damaging, you know, very particular circumstances, very little um, analysis. But um, I think that it is interesting that the court found that the government just knew that this guy was the sole user of the computer. Um, you know, I, I don't know about you, but, you know, I, I use my laptop, my work laptop for all kinds of things and, you know, I, I use it at home and, you know, I, I imagine that that's actually kind of a, a hard thing to really know that this guy is like the sole user of the computer. And um, so anyway, moving on. Next, United States versus Kirshner. So this one is a case out of Michigan. Um, this is a year after the, uh, the second opinion in, in Boucher. Uh, grand jury subpoena situation. Uh, any idea what the charges might have been? Child porn, anybody? Um, the charges being investigated. Um, so in this case, there was a grand jury subpoena and they asked this guy to provide all passwords associated with his computer and all the files on it. And um, the court there, uh, in, a, in a pretty decent opinion, I think, said, uh, well, that would violate the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination because that's very testimonial. I mean, you're asking that he just provide all these passwords and um, so that's, uh, that's a no-go. So good opinion. So that's where the law was for a while. And then uh, just in the last few months, uh, we learned about this case, United States versus Fercozu. Now EFF did an amicus in this case. Uh, situation here is there was a woman uh, and she and her ex-husband um, were being uh, investigated and they were ultimately indicted on uh, mortgage fraud uh, type uh, charges. It's a mortgage fraud. That's like, it's amazing. For, um, it's not child porn at all. Um, <laughs> they got a valid search warrant. The, the, um, the government got a valid search warrant to go to uh, her house and seize computers there. And they seized uh, six computers. Three of those computers were laptops. One of them was encrypted. And uh, the government was like, well, uh, and they, um, they uh, went to a court and asked that she be forced to basically help them execute that search warrant by uh, providing um, her uh, passwords or a decrypted version of the data in the alternative. So uh, again, this is I think a really good uh, point to think about this Fourth Amendment versus Fifth Amendment, right? I mean even if they did everything right and they got a warrant and they checked the boxes, uh, no violation of uh, um, the search and seizure protections of the Constitution, they still need her help, which implicates the Fifth Amendment and it's different, right? Um, so this woman, after the computers were seized, uh, she had a conversation with her ex-husband who was in, in uh, prison uh, on unrelated things. And um, when you talk to somebody in prison, uh, the government, uh, I, I think probably always, records that call. 
And so they had this conversation and she mentioned that uh, these computers had been seized and that there was an encrypted laptop and that uh, she wasn't going to provide the password and um, you know talked a bit about uh, in very uh, vague terms about what might have been on there and the government might be interested in that blah blah blah. And then the government had that recording. And so what they argued was that um, well A they said she didn't have a, a valid fifth amendment privilege against self incrimination but B even if she did uh, it was a foregone conclusion that they were going to find you know that it was hers um, that the stuff on there you know she had control over it that uh, you know the stuff on there was you know authentic so that uh, f the foregone conclusion doctrine would apply so that um, you know she turns it over no big deal because they already know everything that she knows right. And um, in this case they offered her a limited immunity act of production uh, that didn't go any farther so again that's our little elves coming and dropping the evidence on your desk. And um, so the court found that she had to turn over uh, her passwords. And um, what happened there was the court was like well you know uh, there could be a, a privilege here but um, the, the problem is that the government knows uh, that uh, the, the government has pr a pretty good idea that it's hers um, and one of the uh, facts that the, the court identified for, for finding that was that there was a, uh, like a, 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 an account login that they saw that actually had her name in it right on the computer and they said you know they seized it from her house actually from her bedroom. Uh, there's a username that suggested that it's hers. Um, and so you know turning it over isn't going to give them anything that they, they don't already have already in terms of you know trying to link her to the computer. So it's not going to uh, harm her in the sense of you know admitting that she had control over this stuff or, or anything like that because uh, they already know that. They already have independent evidence that, that suggests that. So uh, I'm going to force her to disclose the password that they want. And um, Actually, no, not the password. We're going to force her to provide a decrypted version of the data. That was it. And so um, that raised a really interesting question because, um, you know, was she going to do it or was she not? And um, she had a little bit of time when she, uh, you know, could, you know, think about it and decide. And her lawyer uh, made some noises along the lines of, well, you know, I'm not sure if she knows about it. I, I don't know if she knows the password. I don't know if she can do this, if she can decrypt this data. And, you know, that raises a question that I think a lot of people uh, always have about this is, you know, what happens when, you know, if you really didn't know and the government tried to, you know, force you to turn it over and a judge said you had to and, um, you know, you on it, you know, you didn't know the password, if you, you know, what would happen there? And you know, I've never seen a case where that actually now has happened. Um, it, for Kozu ended in a slightly different way, and I'll tell you about that in a second. But you know, for whatever it's worth, my gut feeling about that is that that would come down to what the judge thinks about your credibility, right? If he thinks that you honestly don't have it, you have nothing to turn over, you cannot decrypt the data. You know, I mean, what what are you going to do, right? Um, but on the other hand, I think if the judge thinks that you're lying then uh, he would likely hold you in contempt and you know I think you might be on the hook for a much more serious problem which is that you know generally it's not a good idea to lie to a judge because that can be perjury and that's, um, that's a, a whole other kettle of fish. So anyway so she, she, she is in this conundrum uh, trying to figure out I guess whether she you know can or wants to turn it over and her co, uh, her, her co defendant ex-husband uh, went ahead and turned over the password. Um, you know, I actually kind of feel for the guy. I, uh, he, he, her lawyer said that he did it because he was, a, was concerned for their children. You know, he didn't want her to go to jail. Um, and so he turned it over. And so that kind of wiped out the whole thing. Because of course, as we've discussed before, if the government has another way of getting it and they don't have to compel you to do anything, that's fair game, right? So, uh, so that's for Kozu. So the most recent one, is United States versus Doe. So in this case, um, the government was investigating uh, a child porn, uh, possible child porn situation. Um, they are, you know, trying to figure out, um, you know, whether they want to uh, bring charges in this case, and if so, against whom. And they identify an individual who uh, they think is of interest, and they get. Uh, 
uh, permission from a court, search warrants, uh, to go seize um, a number of computers. It was two laptops and five external drives from this individual. And it turns out that some portions of those drives were encrypted. And um, they got a grand jury subpoena, they being the government, <laughs> got a grand jury subpoena, um, ordering him to appear and uh, type his uh, password, type a password into, uh, into a computer to decrypt these portions of these drives, which were, by the way, uh, encrypted with TrueCrypt. And he, um, I know, again, this is a, a, a criminal suspect. He hadn't been indicted with anything. He did not have a lawyer. And he showed up and he refused to do it. And then um, the prosecutor said uh, that, uh, the, the prosecutor went to um, the court and said, we want you to order him to show cause why he won't do it. And the court said, tell us why you won't do it. And the guy said, well, because I have a valid Fifth Amendment privilege not to. And besides, uh, I don't know. I don't know, the, I, I can't do it. I don't know the passwords. The court found him in contempt and he went to jail. And, um, you know, I want to note again, he didn't even have a lawyer, all right? And um, I'm sorry if I'm getting like all mad because it, it makes me angry, this situation. And um, this guy, while he was in jail, uh, passed a note along to his sister, which she posted in a, a forum. And basically this, this note was like, hey, I'm in jail uh, because I didn't turn over my, uh, my, I didn't decrypt my data. And that's how we heard about it. Actually, a number of people um, contacted us and said, did you hear about this? And we were like, whoa. And um, it was hard to get any information about it because it was just, it was a criminal investigation. There's nothing on, on a docket about that. And then eventually, after some months, he was assigned uh, an attorney, a federal public defender, and that guy contacted us. And we were like, oh, you know this case. And so um, we did an amicus and his support in that case. Um, it's actually under seal. Um, we, we keep meaning to get it unsealed and hopefully we'll do that so people who are interested can read it. Uh, but uh, the 11th Circuit found in that case that he had a valid privilege against self-incrimination uh, that, that he could exercise, um, that um, the immunity, uh, I forgot to mention, they, he, they offered him active production immunity. Again, the little elves dropping something on your desk. Um, the court said that wasn't enough that it had to be full use and derivative use immunity, and um, that you know, the, uh, the government had no sense what they were gonna really find there. Uh, the fact that um, there, was, there appeared to be data encrypted didn't even necessarily indicate there was data, because the way that TrueCrypt works is blank space is filled with ciphertext, right? So you know, for all the government knew based on you know, looking at the ciphertext, um, there was basically, you know, th they didn't have any evidence there was a big gap in knowledge. All right, let's put it that way. So the guy was uh, released from jail, and that is, I think, the, the, the strongest and most um, powerful precedent on this issue so far. So that's cool. Thank you. So I have five minutes and a bunch more slides, so I'm going to go fast. A few more things to think about, like thinking toward the future, okay? What about other forms of authentication, things that aren't in your mind? What about like biometric uh, credentials or two-factor authentication? So we haven't seen a case with this yet, but um, as I mentioned before, things like uh, you know, uh, fingerprints and blood samples, uh, generally the court's fine do not have this privilege. And so I think that this is a tougher call. All right. It, it is possible under certain circumstances, I think, that you could have a valid Fifth Amendment privilege um, uh, in the act of production, but keep in mind that this stuff here is not as strongly protected under the Fifth Amendment, most likely. Okay. What about encrypted data stored with third parties? So, you know, Fourth Amendment stuff, I'm not going to get into what the government has to do in order to get data from a, a service provider. They have to jump through a bunch of hoops. We're just going to focus on Fifth Amendment stuff. So I think it is possible that a service provider could decrypt your data or turn over your passwords and passphrases in response to legal process or court order if they have the capability. And I'm not picking on Dropbox, but they're very clear about this in their privacy policy. They say we may disclose to parties outside Dropbox files stored in your Dropbox when we have a good faith belief that disclosure is reasonably necessary to comply with a uh, legal request. If we provide your Dropbox files to a law enforcement agency, we will remove Dropbox's encryption from the files. 
However, we will not be able to decrypt any files you encrypted prior to storing them on Dropbox. Okay, so lesson learned, don't have a situation where a service provider has your encryption keys, alright? Keep control over them. Okay, what's the deal everywhere else? So one of our fantastic EFF interns, Whitney Merrill, helped me with this research which I really, really appreciate. Um, uh, answer is it's pretty complicated. <laughs> um, these uh, laws are different all over the world. Some countries require key disclosure or decryption under certain circumstances. Within that classification of laws, some of those laws only require assistance from people who don't have a non-disclosure right. So, um, you know, laws are different in different countries, but I, but some countries uh, have, you know, varying levels of uh, uh, something like a right or a privilege against self-incrimination. And um, so I think that that is the, the primary distinction, uh, you know, within the category here. Now, some company, uh, sorry, some countries restrict the use of crypto within the country. Some countries have import and export restrictions on crypto. That, of course, is beyond the scope of this presentation. But there's a super cool map that you should check out. There's this um, legal scholar uh, in uh, Holland named Bert Jop Koops, who has this uh, crypto law survey. Um, I don't know if you can see this very clearly, but um, so the red countries have uh, domestic controls on use of crypto within the country. The blue countries uh, have uh, laws uh, that require uh, compelled uh, decryption in some circumstances. Uh, the yellow and orange countries have, you know, kind of special flavors of that. And then the green countries have no known domestic controls. And I think it's super interesting how you know, for the most part, it's grouped, right? I mean, you can see that it's very kind of regional. Um, interestingly, Africa, uh, which is, you know, pretty much white here, they have no data, we have no data available for those countries. We don't know what the law is there. So if you're interested in the international stuff, check that out. Takeaways. Okay. The courts have held that it's possible to have a valid Fifth Amendment privilege against compelled disclosure of uh, encryption passphrases or forced decryption, but of course it can be overcome in certain circumstances, like, you know, uh, um, when they already know what's on your laptop or what have you. But there are things that you can do to um, enhance the, like, uh, the likelihood that you might have a privilege, okay? Choose strong passphrases and it's best if you don't have to write them down. Um, XKCD, <laughs> how to choose a strong password, <laughs> high entropy and all that. Uh, password managers I think can be decent for this because if you know uh, the password that you need to get to your other passwords, you know, that's a good, that's something, right? It's a level of protection. Um, understand that certain types of credentials might have weaker Fifth Amendment protections, potentially. Maintain control over your keys and your passwords and your passphrases if you can. Um, don't, uh, you know, I think Mr. Boucher taught us, don't consent to or assist in any search of your files because at that point maybe it's foregone conclusion and when in doubt, uh, talk to a lawyer. All right? Thank you very much, you guys. I really appreciate it. <laughs>